Hey everyone, thank you so much for choosing to join us. I think the, um, actually the battle was quite tough because the other topics are quite exciting as well. Um, but thank you very much for being with us today. Um, I'm Lisa Daoud, I'm a researcher at uh, Group URD and I'm very happy to be facilitating this session. Um, actually, the idea of looking at data algorithms in the sector has been on my mind for a while. Um, uh, more concretely, since the time I was working in Lebanon, and I could witness the consequences of using data algorithms um, in uh, aid targeting, actually, for this uh, very particular case. Uh, but I don't want to spoil it because some of our speaker is going to tell you a bit more about this. Um, actually, I don't even have to introduce this topic too much because Ben Parker from the New Humanitarian uh, was on the launching uh, panel right before the session. And um, he kind of raised the alert already, uh, saying that uh, we, uh, as technical people, as people managing um, uh, algorithms, uh, or people dealing with any type of algorithm in general, have a responsibility to address um, the, the opportunity, the possibility, but also the risks um, that come with data algorithm. Um, we have an amazing set of speakers uh, for this morning session. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, every uh, speaker as we go, uh, but just for you to know that uh, it's going to be a quite nice mix uh, between uh, technical um, people uh, actually uh, making or managing algorithm um, or um, um, uh, members of the, the sector working more on the accountability side of algorithm. So, um, hopefully, and I'm sure actually, uh, quite a nice conversation uh, coming on. So um, in the past decades, uh, we've witnessed a growing use of data algorithms in the humanitarian and development sector. Um, we've seen use of algorithm in predictive analytics uh, or beneficiary selection. Um, and this comes with a huge uh, change actually in field operations but also in accountability and transparency of aid. Um, so just like it does in our citizens' lives, and Ben mentioned uh, some examples, um, like the use of uh, algorithm by Facebook or any other social media, um, this comes with major ethical questions. So as you might have seen in the, the abstract of this session, this roundtable will aim to address uh, some key issues, um, key major issues when it comes to using algorithms. So first of all, what are they? Uh, what examples do we have of the use of data algorithms in the sector? Um, can algorithms be inclusive? Um, and what does it take to make them more transparent? And finally, what kinds of uh, concrete safeguards, um, and our speakers will give, will give out some tips um, and principles that should be put in place when using algorithms. So I'm going to kickstart the conversation. Uh, before I do that, uh, please don't hesitate to use the Q&A um, box of, the, of Zoom uh, at any time during the conversation. So please use the Q&A one rather than the chat box if you want to raise a question. Why that is because it will allow other participants to promote your questions. Um, and also, I'm going to ask the speakers if they can and if they want, um, start answering some of your questions as we go. Uh, please don't hesitate to do that. But it's going to be easier if you guys use the Q&A section rather than the chat box. You can use the chat box, uh, but maybe just for sharing thoughts or to share also links to uh, useful resources and all that. Um, we are going to first hear uh, our speakers and then we will also have time to answer to the questions orally. So yeah, uh, please don't hesitate to post. Um, all right, so before we jump to concrete examples and to, to the issue of, of inclusiveness, inclusiveness uh, together with the speakers, we thought it was important to first define what algorithms are because it's also very trendy, trendy words. Um, and to help us start the conversation on the right foot, I'm going to ask uh, our first speaker, Fan Man Sang. Fan Man is CDAC's Director of Common Services, Capacity Bridging and Technology. Um, and thank you very much 
first of all, Fanman, for being here uh, with us. Um, could you please explain to us what exactly we're talking about here? What are algorithms? And I think you would need to unmute if I'm not mistaken. Perfect. Sorry, you are, Lisa, you're absolutely right. So um, yes, <laughs> it's been quiet there. But um, no, I just say this is something that something we've always come across, um, in my experience, in the humanitarian development, where something new comes along, everybody thinks it's going to revolutionize it, and everybody piles in. And currently, the talk is using algorithms to make everything work better. And the problem I have sometimes when I talk to people in my, uh, in my aspect of basically capacity bridging, so making you know, capacities across here, is that everybody has a slightly different definition of algorithm. Nobody quite, you know, so they, they talk about it as this thing when really, you want to break it down, an algorithm really is just a set of instructions. It is all it means, an algorithm is, is a collection of formula and instructions for undertaking a task. And I think we need to really keep sight of this. Now, this, can, this task can be really simple, such as, um, when do we turn the lights on, when it gets dark, when it gets a certain light level, light comes on, simple algorithm. Or it can be very complicated, like a social media engine that basically create links with people and find out what's people going on. Either way, they are just a set of instructions. And if we do not understand how complicated those instructions are and how they work together, then we are in trouble because the one difference between a system that's an algorithmic system compared to other systems we worked with before is that there is very little oversight while it happens. It is fully automated. And not only that, if we start building on systems next to systems and we put algorithms next to algorithms next to algorithms, they can interact in ways that we know we are not exactly understanding how they're interacting because they are fully automatic and there's very little oversight. So then the question we have to ask ourselves is this, are we in a rush to employ algorithmic systems because we've heard the headline of how quickly they can work things? Or are we actually finding, identifying actual needs that need automating? And the key words here is, do these processes need automating? Because the danger is, once an automatic system starts working, we have very little ability to stop it at the speed that we're used to. Because an algorithm system is run on computers. Computers run at billions of calculations per second and they go. By the time you notice something's gone wrong, you may not be, you may be quite far down the line. You might have a fantastic algorithm that spots malnutrition based on people using cashless systems, buying certain types of um, food supplements. And if they're not doing that, then everything's fine. This could quickly calculate to the fact that um, you're thinking lots of villages are fine because these algorithms telling you everything is fine because the calculation has gone forward when actually what's happened is that the people are not buying them because A, the system's broken down or B, they're in the middle of a famine and they've switched to buying something else but the algorithm does not have that built into it because the design hasn't built into it by the time you've worked out to it, it's cascaded across. So, and then it's been taking data from another algorithm and so on. And suddenly the law of unintended consequences kick in. And you could say the fact that this happens to anybody. I'm fairly certain the developers of Facebook did not intend to totally disrupt democracy as we know it, but that's where they're doing at the moment. I, I know for a fact the people behind Twitter um, intended it to be a social, social place where you can meet for coffee and find out what your friends are up to rather than being a major news source. I mean, and then, there's, and then there's more persuasive ones where I'm sure people designing face recognition systems didn't expect in Western countries to say black people are more likely to commit crime because of a database they use from the police. But that's what happened. But they also, these things can go quite far down the line before anybody stops them. So I would say before we deploy the system, do we understand why it needs automating? And if it does need automating, how far does the automation go? And thirdly, do you have any idea of how quickly we need to employ the oversight mechanisms before the law of unintended consequences kick in? Great, thank you so much for this. And I think it sets the tone also of this conversation because so we've defined algorithm, but we've also started to see that it does come with consequent challenges, right? Um, uh, before digging a bit more into this, um, I'm going to give the floor to Liz Hendry uh, to look at one of the current examples at big scale uh, of the use of data algorithms in the humanitarian sector. 
Thank you, Liz Hendry, for accepting to join the conversation. You're the consortium manager for the Cash Monitoring Evaluation Accountability and Learning Organizational Network, also called Chameleon in, Lib in Lebanon. Um, so Liz, could you tell us a bit more about what it's being done in Lebanon? Yes, will do. Thanks, Lisa, and uh, greetings, everybody, from Beirut. So in Lebanon, uh, an algorithm is used um, as part of targeting for, for cash and voucher assistance for Syrian refugees. Um, so at the moment, um, 84,000 households receive um, cash assistance from the UN every month as unrestricted transfers. Um, and so you're looking at more than 400,000 refugees are, who are receiving these um, transfers every month. And in addition to that, more families who are receiving food, food vouchers. So it's a, it's a huge response. It's one of the largest uh, humanitarian cash responses in the world. And, um, you know, one of the elements of the programming that has been most sort of hotly debated has been around targeting, you know, who do you decide uh, which families um, receive assistance, because although the number of people in the caseload is very big, the number of those who are also in need and don't receive assistance is even bigger. I and mean, there's, there's about 1.5 million Syrian refugees in, in Lebanon. So, um, you know, there's been discussions since cash began uh, as a form of humanitarian assistance about how to best target it. And in 2016, a decision was made to move away from doing household um, questionnaires um, to having a sort of desk based algorithm, which would um, be used to rank families um, by their social economic vulnerability to, to identify um, you know, who of those are amongst the most severely vulnerable. And the targeting system is, is driven by the UN. It's, it's managed by a kind of common platform that's called Louise, um, but it's also used by NGOs as well. And so I think that's a really important point that it's an algorithm that's developed by a group, but it's used by a, a wider community of actors. Um, and so at the time that it was introduced, there were there were a lot of concerns with people, um, you know, wondering like, was this going to be an accountable and transparent way of targeting? And so one of the things that was set up um, in order to sort of strengthen the accountability was comedians. So we were a group of NGOs. Uh, we're co-managed by NRC and Oxfam and Solidarity International. And our work is to look at uh, WFP's cash program. So, so WFP is one of the largest implementers of cash. And through our work, it's touched upon uh, the targeting system. So we've done a, a collaboration with CALP, um, looking at accountability in, in the program, which has got, also got a lot of recommendations for the wider Louise platform as well. I can share the link to that. Um, but that was one of the, the kind of the means that was put in place really to sort of ask some of these questions on behalf of the kind of wider humanitarian community about the algorithm. Thank you for this. And, and fun fact, actually, um, the, the Louise platform was uh, called of uh, using the name of one of my uh, former colleague and friends because she was oh. the one advocating for more That's collaboration it. between the human agencies. Well, yeah, <laughs> giving a human face to uh, technology. <laughs> uh, but so when we were preparing this session, Liz, you were telling me that the use of a formula for targeting was particularly sensitive in the context of Lebanon. Why is that? Yes, I mean, I would really agree. I think targeting, maybe a bit less so than a few years ago, but it's still a very important and quite emotive uh, element of, of cash programming and discussions in Lebanon. And that's because, as mentioned, the scale is huge. But other important factors are that the, the differences between family situations is really, really small. Um, and there's not enough resources coming from, from donor agencies to assist everybody who is kind of in theory eligible. So in, in theory, all families that are classed as being under the extreme poverty line are eligible for cash assistance. In reality, uh, the beginning of, of the last program cycle, there was only enough funding to uh, help one in three of those families. So it means that you do have to have targeting because you have to decide, you know, how do you use these stretch resources? But if you think about it from the perspective of families, you know, they, they don't see anybody um, as part of this, this process of ranking the algorithm because it, 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 it mainly takes place through a sort of administrative approach. 
Um, so it means that they don't get visited to ask about their situations. Um, they see very little difference in their situation compared to those around them. And also because um, with the ranking, it can mean that families who were previously above them or not in Lebanon could then in the next year be kind of uh, ranked as being more severely vulnerable than you know, a particular family. It means that you could be in a situation as a Syrian refugee family where nothing has changed about your circumstances, but by dint of the fact that other families have kind of been classed as being more severely vulnerable than you, so just your relative to position to other people, you could be discontinued from assistance. And so it's kind of contributed to perceptions amongst refugee communities that the, the targeting is not um, based on a kind of fair and transparent uh, system. It kind of contributes to this feeling that uh, there are kind of winners and losers of the targeting approach and contributes to, to community tensions as well. I think this last, last fact specifically is quite uh, frightening. So if, if I understand it well, and if I can put it this way, um, there are life-changing decisions that are made. Basically, if I, as a family, receive money or not for the next month, uh, using this um, formula, the proxy means test formula, um, and this seems particularly dangerous, as, you, as you're mentioning, um, especially when you, we know uh, through studies that inclusion ex and exclusion errors with this kind of formula are quite high. Um, however, and, and and maybe I'm going to, to also uh, uh, suggest that we can maybe answer to Edith on, on the Q&A box at the same time. Um, it is still being done that way. And it's been done that way since 2014 or so, if, I, if I'm remembering well. Um, why is that? So maybe if you, can, if you could briefly give us a bit more information about how um, uh, the information, uh, uh, what, what kinds of information are used uh, for ranking and how is it been collected um, and also maybe explaining to us what's the real debate is about now in Lebanon if it's still being done this way. Yeah absolutely so I mean I think the first thing to to kind of highlight is that you know there were no easy options because of these realities we talked about because of the scale because of the lack of resources I mean if you had enough resources you wouldn't need to kind of do this ranking you could just give everybody who is classed as severely vulnerable the assistance so I think um, it's important to say there's no kind of perfect solution and and every solution every targeting approach comes with its sort of the, its pros and cons its strengths and weaknesses so i i do think there is an element of this this is about making the tough programmatic decisions in a protracted crisis and a decision has been made that this this algorithm is the is the best approach to take um i also think that you know having kind of um, you know, I think the UN has been uh, very good at sharing a lot more information over the past few years about how it kind of tests the algorithm, it shares its analysis in, in sector coordination groups, um, having kind of uh, third party components to these programs like Comedian means that, you know, you do have that opportunity to um, independently kind of, um, you know, critique and explore whether the, the algorithm is doing, uh, you know, is seen to be doing a good job. And I think the general feeling is that it kind of is, but one of the real challenges is that, um, you know, it's based on data about refugees that's captured in, in the UNHCR registration database. And so it kind of is reliant on that information being kept up to date. And I think it also means that families need to know that you know, this keeping uh, UNHCR informed about their situation is really important because this is the sorts of information that will help to determine whether they get assistance or not. So I think that kind of um, about, you know, it's been very important to kind of consider what's the kind of key data where ensuring that the data is, is good quality and uh, is, is up to date is important. And in, in the case of Lebanon, it's about ensuring that people do know that. And then I think the other key thing is about um, is about communication to communities and recognizing the fact that one of the unfortunate challenges of PTM approaches is that it's very difficult to explain. I mean, actually, not only to communities, but also to other humanitarian actors 
about uh, how it works. Um, and so this makes it difficult for, you know, for people to kind of understand that it is based on a sort of uh, a rigorous process. And then the final thing I would say is that I think, you know, money is also a factor here, because if you're in a situation where you've got um, limited resources, then you have to make really difficult decisions about, you know, every dollar that you spend on investing in the program side, like, you know, accountability targeting systems, is one dollar less that goes directly to refugees. So I think this builds into a bigger discussion about, you know, how much money should we be putting into accountability systems to make a kind of a, a quality uh, program. Um, and it's very sort of stark with cash programs because you can really see that cost transfer ratio. You can really see, you know, how much money you're putting into the kind of program side versus going directly to refugees. Thank you for that. And I'm going to move on and Edith, I've seen your questions and I think it's going to be um, a good way to dig deeper after the, the presentation on, on, on the, the, the case of, uh, of Lebanon. Um, so keeping this uh, question in mind. Um, um, so what I understand is that um, we're not in the situation of saying one is good and one is bad, but rather to trade off somehow um, uh, and to find ways of algorithms uh, working in the best and, and, to, and to limit the risks uh, when using them. Uh, to illustrate a little bit more about this, I'm going to uh, give the floor um, to Sofia, Sofia Kiriasi. Um, Sofia, you're an artificial intelligence engineer at the UN Ref Refugee Agency's Innovation Service, um, and you currently support UNHCR's artificial intelligence projects. Um, Sofia has interesting examples uh, that can highlight considerable issues that need to be taken into account when putting the algorithm in place. Um, among these issues, Sophia wanted to um, spotlight the issue of bias. Um, so Sophia, thank you so much for accepting to join the conversation. Uh, you say, and I'm quoting, uh, the threat is that machines replicate bias and are thus more dangerous. Um, why is that? Why is it so important to avoid algorithmic bias, if I can say so? Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Hello. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I can start by addressing the question on why machines are more dangerous. Um, Fanman defined um, machines as we use them uh, as algorithmically supported processes, um, or we call them AI systems. Uh, the biggest is issue with those systems is that they are undefined bias. Um, another reason is that users can start using AI-powered systems a bit mindlessly, and it has been proven uh, that they do start using them like that. And there is a significant research, research that shows that uh, users become less and less accountable towards the system, um, uh, having less judgment and involvement in the loop of a decision. Um, as they're like, uh, likely to assume that the, object, the systems are objective and uh, they accept them as the experts now on the subject matter. Um, and then also um, sometimes for the side of development, the ones that are providing these kinds of algorithmically supported systems, uh, if it's an organization or if it's a company, that there is no appeals process in place as these systems um, get invented to cut costs in the first place. Uh, so I think that covers it on uh, why it can be dangerous. And then also the bias uh, is always uh, a threat. Uh, as you know, the systems can up amplify bias. As Panama, I guess, again uh, mentioned before, we have more processing of information and like more and more decisions being made in the system. Uh, and when they're used at scale, the negative effects can have a big impact. Uh, there are different types of bias uh, that can uh, be rep uh, replicated and uh, uh, basically uh, brought to the users uh, through those systems. Uh, we have usually we're dealing with representation bias and historical bias. The representation bias is, comes uh, from the data because that's how it was collected. Uh, some groups maybe were not uh, represented equally. Um, and as, for example, uh, like Liz mentioned before, some families were not even like uh, thinking of applying of um, providing continuously data to UNHCR so that they are still in the system, uh, etc. 
So also historic bias exists always, and it has those socially constructed variables that come with it. Uh, so it's the unjust bias that we don't we need we only see after it happens. Um, so yes, I think it has been proven that humans think about a system as error free, and bias is a threat uh, to a fair decision uh, and can cause actually harm, especially for us humanitarians. Um, and it was an interesting quote from Cathy O'Neill in, in her book, My Weapons of Mass Destruction, and I think it's worth mentioning that the privileged get processed by people and the poor get processed by algorithms, which is the case, again, with the cost-cutting uh, methods that everyone wants to use. So I think it is important to unveil a system or a process embedded by us to design AI-based solutions. And when it comes down to making the decision for a human, as is the case for the decision makers in the humanitarian sector, and AI is not considering the ethics, but the humans, the team that develops, the, uh, the ones that are responsible for the design, and those are to be considering the ethics. Um, and as AI is being more and uh, more often used uh, than in the past to solve some of the most pressing humanitarian challenges, I think it is important for the humanitarian actors to navigate the space between legality, because also that is not covered yet, and ethicality. Um, and again, there are a lot of organizations that work uh, with ethics, uh, the Magdula Center of Applied Ethics. Uh, a lot of, I think, studies have also taken a shift to uh, like studying uh, ethics uh, and how they apply them in their field, if it's a scientific field. So, yes, I think it's really important to keep everyone informed and like constantly learning about um, the space. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. And I actually really appreciate your the quote that you used by Katie Oni on the privileged are processed by people, the poor are processed by algorithm. And when you look at social security systems in most countries around the world, it's true that most of the time states uh, and organizations have turned to algorithms to, to, to target. Um, so thanks really much for this. Um, it's quite quite scary, uh, I must say. When we were preparing the session, we were getting to all the the, the, the risks uh, of using uh, such algorithms. But um, thankfully, we had a, a glimpse of hope uh, with Claire uh, Benard, which um, is one of the people saying, "Yes, inclusive algorithms are a reality." Uh, so um, it, personally, it, it was a it, it was a really uh, um, good to have you uh, on on board, Claire, during this uh, this, this preparation and this conversation. Um, so from your work, uh, Claire, as a data scientist, uh, both as a volunteer for that data kind and professionally in WeFarm, um, you uh, have some very inspiring examples uh, to, to describe to us. Yeah, so um, just for context for people who would not have heard of data kind, uh, we're a, a pro bono data scientist community and we support charities and, and social enterprises in different ways um, through their digital transformation and data maturity. Um, so I think we're the best place to see uh, data being used for the right reasons and in the right way. Um, and so I want to start with giving a couple of examples, uh, one that I'm really close to because it's WeFarm and I now work full time for WeFarm as a data scientist. Um, and the other one is uh, a project that was led with an organization called Global Witness, uh, which was about using data to fight corruption. Um, so the WeFarm example, so uh, back in the days when WeFarm was a very small startup, um, it started as, well, yeah, it started as a sort of like internet forum, but without the internet. So if you think about Stack Overflow or Quora or Mumsnet, like this type of um, forums where people can ask questions and get an answer from other people. Um, but we, so we farm has the objective to connect uh, 1 million, 100 million farmers uh, to the information inputs and markets they need to um, reach their full economic potential. Um, and so these 100 million farmers um, don't all have access to the internet. So the challenge was, can we, can we do this? Uh, using uh, like future phones, like normal, not smartphones. Um, so the idea is that the farmers can text the platform and this question gets sent to other farmers on the platform. To start with, this was a really clunky system. 
um, it was meant made with like literally you start your SMS with Q and ask your question, then we receive it. We send it to a random number of farmers who then have to answer using uh, a, a number, so a binding number. So they're saying Q123 and the answer to the question. Um, this was very cumbersome and there was loads of mistakes. Um, and so we found reached out to DataKind and um, they organized, I wasn't part of it at the time, but they organized a data dive. So for a weekend, loads of data scientists help WeFarm build machine learning to try and support this system so that if a user like, forgets to put Q at the start of their question, it recognizes that it is a question. Um, then it checks that it's not offensive content and then sends it to a targeted number of farmers who are more likely to have the answer to the question. Um, so this is really an example of using data and machine learning in a way that makes, so it gives access to farmers who don't necessarily speak English because it's quite challenging. A lot of the libraries, like software that is developed at the moment is developed in English, uh, but we found works in other languages. And, and using machine learning, we are able to give access to knowledge to farmers who would not have other sources of knowledge normally other than their direct communities. Um, so I think this is a great example of using AI and machine learning in a way that really like, like expands the potential of what people would normally have access to. Um, and I think it's important that charities and social enterprises think about data beyond just needs assessment and impact assessment, but also like how can we build machine learning powered tools that will make systems more efficient or that will make life easier um, for people who don't necessarily have access to all of the technologies or all of the uh, the potentiality that we have um, in you know a peaceful Western world. Um, the other example was Global Witness. So uh, 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 I think it was a couple of years ago now, uh, the UK released the company's house data, which is uh, a big registrar of, of uh, companies in the UK. It has uh, the name of the company as well as the uh, beneficial owner and a people of significant control. Um, and so with Global Witness, DataKind spent like a weekend again um, going through this data and to cut a quite long story short, they managed to build a tool that was helping uh, surfacing potential illegal structure or potential uh, tax evasion. Um, so this meant that instead of having to search through 1.3 million records of, of companies, uh, Global Witness had to look through like maybe the top 20 or top 100 companies that were potentially um, fraudulent. So it made their advocacy job and their research like investigation job so much easier and was like super impactful in both making the company's house data better because they could surface problems with the data quality, uh, but also making the investigation and transparency work so much easier. Um, so I think these two examples are a good example of going beyond simply impact assessment or monitoring and, and seeing how using data can really have a, a global impact. I really like your especially your first example resonates with what Fanman was saying um, about the why we're using algorithms. <clears throat> and it's actually really inspiring to see that there is a, a way to use them in a socially responsible way. Uh, but before going uh, back to Fanman, um, maybe digging deep a little bit into your examples, Claire, what does it take then? What does it take to have an inclusive algorithm? Do you have any concrete tips that you could share with us? Yeah, I, I don't know if they're tips or more like principles, um, but I think one really important thing is the, the quality of the data. Um, so if you can't trust the data that you input into the algorithm, as, as Fanman said, like the algorithm is, is only going to automate, right? Uh, Sophia also mentioned like the, the computer is not responsible for the ethics, it's the, it's the human. So, so the quality of the data is really important. One example was when I was in Lebanon, um, I feel like that's a bit of a common denominator on this panel. Um, I was leading a, a needs assessment um, exercise and you know, I had done all of the consent page explaining what this survey was about and asking for people's informed consent. And I don't speak Arabic, but I went to one of the one of the interviews and I could clearly see that the person who was collecting the data skipped through that section. 
So the people were giving their data, they had ticked the box saying that they were consenting, but I had no faith that they actually understood what this data was about. So I had no faith that they had the right incentives to give me correct data, which in this case didn't matter a lot because the idea was to aggregate information. And overall, I think the data was still correlated to the truth and the reality, but I would never have thought that this was good enough data to then make individual decisions. So I think it's really important to know like how much can you trust your data and would you trust it to, to do whatever you're thinking of doing with it. And then the second thing that is really important is the quality of the people. I think it's really, it's really important to have people who are like experts um, and, and not just have like a data intern. My, my first role in the charity sector, I was a data intern and there was literally no one above me with any data expertise. Um, and I, I think that's a real mistake. I think you need to have people who are um, experts in, in data, machine learning and artificial intelligence if this is what you're gonna be developing as an organization. And these people need to be accountable for the decisions they make, for how they use the data and for the, the checks and, and balances that they put in place. Um, they're also responsible for leading the right conversations. I think conversations like the one we're having today is, are really important because the more people are aware of the risks the better they can be managed. It's not like ethics is a new new field, right? Like we make these life death decisions all the time. If you ask doctors, they, they have to make these kind of life, de life death decisions, uh, deciding on treatment or deciding on like putting a new, like a patient through an experimental treatment, which could have devastating consequences. And so I think we know how to deal with ethics. We just need to make sure that these conversations are actually happening and that we're constantly reflecting and, and, and having like people who are leading on, on this and are held accountable for the decisions they make. Um, and the last thing I would say is make sure you use the right tool for the right problem. No one goes like sunbathing in their ski jacket or skiing in their shorts, right? Like, and I think it's as simple as that for data and algorithms. Like it's sometimes a bar chart is actually what you need. You need to, look at the information you have to inform part of your decision. And the decision lies within a group of human beings who are trying to optimize the way they're gonna distribute aid or the logistics of uh, their project. And sometimes you have enough good data that you have the opportunity to develop a, a fully fleshed algorithm that's gonna really help like build a new app or, or build a new like fraud detection system. And I think it's important to really use the right, the right tool for the right thing, knowing what you, what you have um, and making sure that you really understand the limitation of your resources um, and that you're able to also spot the right opportunities. Thanks a lot, Claire, for this. Um, and please don't hesitate, participants, uh, to share any comments or any questions that you have in the Q&A box. Um, Going around for a, a last uh, round of uh, reactions to what we've discussed uh, uh, to, to, to my uh, speakers. Uh, Fanman, starting with you, you also talk a lot about how to ensure algorithm an algorithm actually benefit marginalized uh, and overlooked uh, communities and, and people. Could you maybe tell us a few more words about that? Yes, um, I'd love, I love to. But um, before that, yeah, just to, to comment on something Claire mentioned about please don't let the intern be in charge of this because this is far too important. This is this major system design. And just the example of my part about how different sectors, we can maybe learn from different sectors. When I first left university quite a long time ago, um, I went to, um, had a temporary job in a very large major bank, um, International Global Bank where for some reason, because of shuffling around, I ended up designing a small part of an algorithm on risk management about assessing risk. That small major bank was called Lehman Brothers, so which, they, which collapsed and took down the global economy with it. I don't think I had much part in it. It was a very long time ago. But the point was, uh, you think about it, as somebody who was just doing a temporary job on an hourly payment basis, I should, probably should never been put anywhere near the risk management team. <laughs> but um, it, is, it is a case of, it's complicated, they put somebody there. So that's the, so the first part I would really talk about is it just really comes down to design. It's the fact that you have to absolutely, and the design in two parts, which is, do you understand why the algorithm is there? Why you use, why you need to automate this and how does it work? And two, 
um, the quality of the data. And again, I mean, we looked into, well, I run accountability and feedback mechanisms um, in the past. And one of the things we looked into was basically automating it. We were getting a lot of data coming in and it was very hard to analyze with so much data. So somebody suggested we should use the algorithm to automate it. That was great. And they, and they showed us some great results. And of course, it was only at that point that we went, where are you getting this, how are you getting this data? Because they asked, because like, we just looked at the stuff you wrote down. We said, well, this is all being badly translated from 16 different ethnic languages. And they were going, oh, well, but we found some good quality stuff. But the good quality stuff only applied to this small section from, um, from the privileged elite group, group of people we're working with. And they were going, well, and their main concerns were so divorced from the most people. It was all politics-based rather than food-based and safety. And there was, and they were going, and we look into it, they were saying that, you know, saying that you have nothing to do with, um, so like so young people and women were not included at all. And they were saying, oh yes, but they didn't supply that much. And it was, and it was basically a complete mess. So that didn't quite work. And we employed this firm and then we realized was, this was that the design of it had totally the wrong premises and we wasn't focused on the actual point of doing this which was to increase this and the first thing you had to do is something was redesign fundamentally the translation system so every single part of the reason why we we're operating it was had to be redesigned to fit the algorithm so once we had done that then we hit a second snatch which was now we were generating so much data which was useful they couldn't, you know, the other parts of the humanitarian response could not actually cope with it. And they ignored it because it was just so much stuff that they were lit by a war of hopelessness of this is terrible without, without then we need to automate a level of delivery. And, the, and it all comes, all this comes down to the fact that you need to have really good data. You need to understand how the technology works. And one of the things that we quickly worked out with cameras and assessing people was reflectivity index. So we were not super experts in this, and we didn't realize the fact that um, cameras were built with default reflectivity index when they're photographing people based on um, basically a German, a, you know, a white German person was was apparently was was is the is the standard reflectivity index. And I encourage everyone to read the book called Invisible Women about why why all data, a lot of so much data is only applies to men and not women because. Um, for instance, car there was no crash test studies are women. So, you, so for in our, in our case, our cameras had to be redesigned, um, our analysis system was redesigned, our entire translation systems were redesigned. Every, every single thing had to be redesigned, and the cost of doing all that to save money with an algorithm system cost slightly more than the project. And but if we invest in this in future projects, it'd be really useful. But it's a case of the cost of building a decent algorithmic system to automate feedback um, was huge. So we had to do targeted systems, but it, but it can make it better. You just need to start on what's achievable within your budget and to take into account from the ground up the who do you need to, what do, how do you get the quality of the data, what do you need to find out about it, and all the factors involved. And it all comes back then again to the skill level of the person designing the system. Is the person designing the system actually skillful enough and have the context to do this? And we hired somebody who was skillful enough, but they were from California and they had never set foot in Eastern Africa. So, so it's a skill level in every aspect of it. And, um, and of course, whilst there was inbuilt bias, which was we didn't actually, when we put the tender, which didn't actually go to local companies. So we went to local companies. So there's all these other things which are actually nothing to do with algorithm are necessary to make the algorithm better. So then it comes down to employing it there's a local technology. You know, then we need to get the technology was the fact that do we need more technology? One of the things I would encourage people to recommend to think about is this. If you're going to build a better algorithm system, should technical systems to collect data be part of NFIs to hand out to people? Because if you do that, you increase the reach of the technology to gather good data massively. Could it should NFI collect should NFIs include data collection technology of some sort? But I know just a thought out there. The second thing is to think to yourself is if you're going to save money with algorithms right, and automate things, maybe the person you're automating are the international managers. Maybe they're the first part you automate out of the way. Because they're the people 
because 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 you know they're the people who may not be best suited for this and they don't know the analysis at that level and maybe you need more people more investment on the ground on the data collection is where you put the massive investment um so it is again back down to the skill of the person designing the system and why you are doing this are you doing this to prove that you have an algorithm or are you doing the proof to make your system better if you start with those premises then maybe you you, you build a foundation so the, the the why and this and the skills and the the cost also i really like that you're raising this point because i think this is another reason it is uh, the responsibility of the of the people in the organization to think twice before using an algorithm. Most of the time, the costs are enormous. Um, thank you so much for this, Fan Man. Uh, Sophia, going back to you, any other uh, concrete uh, ways of making an algorithm inclusive other than you know, defining the why, using the good uh, skill set, uh, looking at the budget? Yeah, so I think exactly what Claire and Panman were mentioning on how they were dealing with the project and how uh, they thought the best approach was, um, is the same thing also that comes down to UNHCR, and, and especially because we work a lot with innovation uh, approaches. And um, for example, what, what was mentioned, the diversity of the team, uh, having the experts on board, I think it's really uh, important. Uh, not just because uh, they can design something that is perfect, right? But then also because they, everyone brings a different angle uh, to the problem. And then uh, I think also the organization itself should, should have this mechanism of like uh, praising those watchdogs. I think there were some interesting articles as well of having maybe externals, maybe a peer reviewing system, uh, something that could just lift a little bit uh, some of the fears that even the design, the team of designers and developers uh, have, and also like communicate something that uh, can be uh, taken through a second process of thinking, right? Uh, so also it's good to reward these behaviors, even if they come from within the team, but also have a diverse team. I agree with the, the idea of, uh, for example, like getting a bit of knowledge of what can go wrong with the data. Uh, as Fan also yeah, <laughs> recommended a book, I agree with uh, with that recommendation. Uh, so basically asking a little bit the questions pre facto before we start even building something, I think it's really important. Um, and then maybe uh, to expand the ethical uh, cycle because we have the stakeholders, we have the people that will just uh, be um, not even implicitly using the system, um, and then those that you are serving, we should you should also also con, uh, consult always with them and don't assume just that you know their needs uh, exactly. And then of course there is also like pre-existing methods and works that have been done, maybe not exactly the same, but uh, well, I think Claire mentioned that uh, uh, you have this uh, like doctors always. Uh, thinking of ethics and having that uh, in the back of their heads when they are uh, dealing with uh, patients and also other systems that have, for example, like recruitment systems or anything that have been proven faulty. And so there are lessons that we can learn from these systems or like from these teams and why, what were the limitations and why they were not able to deliver a product that is uh, not uh, uh, wrong. And then I think also uh, this is from a course also online uh, that you always have to have in mind the terrible people. So the people that will always like try to harm the system or manipulate it in a way that they could benefit from. So playing a little bit with the measures of uh, what you think your successful system is, just knowing that there are always people that would play against those measures to manipulate it. And then I think another important point is that even if you have a system in place, I think it's good to always uh, keep it a bit open so that it can be examined, uh, let's say, by the peer review system or that it serves to a level of transparency or for those that it serves, that they have um, a way to maybe uh, second guess the system or uh, give maybe back feedback so that you know that uh, there are things that are not working uh, and not, for example, like have to take it through the legal uh, system to address those issues. I think that um, those are the points that I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is uh, this is complementing nicely the list. Uh, thank you, Sophia. Claire, I see you on mute. Do you want did you want to react to any of these things? Yeah, I just wanted to add some something uh, just building on top when I when I talked about 
the expert, like making sure that you have some some data people in charge of the algorithms. Um, I, I want to make sure that there is an underlying assumption there. Um, so to me, an expert in AI, machine learning or data is actually someone who's both really good at the stats and knows their like, you know, probability theory, but also is someone who is good at, you know, leading on these ethical discussions who won't get tripped over by the fact that there is bias in the data because they've heard before that bias was a problem. And so it's not someone just who's good at building the thing, but it's also someone who's good at at knowing, evaluating risks and mitigating risks. And, and I think that goes with uh, domain knowledge, knowing, like looking at past experiences, like what Sophia was just mentioning, like some other people are doing it. Some other people have made mistakes in the past. What can we learn from them? And I think it's it's part of these like senior managers to the role to learn and, and make sure that they keep up to speed with that. And being good at your data job is not just being good at data, it's being good at all of these other things as well. Um, yeah, I, can I just jump in and just absolutely agree 100% with that? I mean, the issue I always find is about that, when we'll come back to the point I'm making, is that people don't budget enough to get that person. They, the biggest problem is, and I don't mean budget just in budgeting uh, money and funding, I'm talking about budgeting time. Um, they quite often shove that role to somebody who's already full, fully employed doing something else, maybe an M&E or something. It is, it's a case of, oh, well, you're fully employed already doing something that, so that's underfunded. Here, have something else that's, that's slightly even more complicated than what you're doing now and take it on. And now we will now outsource it to the something that could hit this budget point rather than have this ability to do it. I 100% I agree with Claire, Claire that that is absolutely critical. And I, and I do not think that so quite, in my experience, a lot of people I speak to um, quite have taken the full ramifications of what Claire said on board on a funding, budgeting and um, um, resourcing level. Thank you very much for raising this point. Um, and maybe to um, finish the, the overall presentation and move on to the, the, the question and answers. Um, and don't hesitate, uh, please, if you if you have other questions to, to raise them in the in the the, the Q and A box. Um, so, Liz, I'm going to go back to you. Um, so, asking you because I know uh, all of the things that we just mentioned about how to make algorithm more inclusive resonate to some of the things that Chameleon has put in place. Um, and and let's uh, take this opportunity to answer Edith's questions, uh, which was: Have there been several iterations of the algorithms based on feedbacks? And yes, um, uh, feedbacks from whom? Over to you, Liz. Yeah, thank you. And it's a great question um, from Edith. So thank, thanks for that. I mean, I think one of the really encouraging things in Lebanon is over the past few years, there have been improvements on a yearly basis in the targeting. And, and that has kind of been informed by um, feedback from, from a number of different directions, including from communities themselves, um, from entities such as Chameleon and other NGOs, um, and I think also from learning that's come within the UN. So what happens is that, you know, a, a group, an external group has kind of, it's been brought in to help support the, the recalibration process every year. And that has led to changes in refinements to the algorithm itself, but also uh, refinements to the, 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 the targeting process as well and the community outreach. Um, and I think some of the most kind of important developments has been the, the development of a grievance redress mechanism in the past few years. So there is an opportunity for um, for community members, for families to kind of to, to appeal if they're, they're not included, um, more focus on community outreach about the targeting process. Um, refinements to the, 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 the call center and other sorts of forms of complaints and feedback. So I, I think that's that's been a kind of very positive move. I think thinking about now going forward, um, you know, what we, we need to do is keep, you know, having these conversations about, you know, bringing together the states of evidence from a number of different actors, not just the UN, but other stakeholders, listening to communities about, is this still the best approach, given all the things that we've talked about before, about the kind of the, the limitations and the trade-offs that need to be made? 
for others apart from the UN to kind of be continue to be brought into the space where we can be that critical friend and ask the questions and I think picking up on what um, Claire mentioned before you know you need people who are able to ask those technical questions who can understand it can open the black box to know what to kind of ask and I think that was something that um, you know has kind of grown over the last few years which has been good um, but I think you know there's also two final thoughts uh, you know I think that this point about cost is important because often this is one of the justifications for choosing automated approaches is that it's better value for money and so I think we need to kind of question value for money for whom and kind of recognize that you know our definitions of that have tended to be a sort of quite donor centric approach um, to defining value for money and we need to ensure that we're including beneficiaries affected populations in that and also to really understand more about how our automated process is experienced from the perspective of communities. So this is an element that we're doing our work as Chameleon is, is um, collaborating with groups like Ground Truth Solutions to um, you know, capture user journeys and to understand you know, how easy, how clear, how accessible is it for different profiles of families um, to interact with the program and what are the ways that it could be improved um, particularly to make it more kind of transparent as well. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, and please don't hesitate, Edith or others, um, if you want more um, details about this. But thanks, I think that clarifies. Um, and please don't hesitate if you have any, any other sorts of questions. Uh, Claire, uh, we wanted to finish this, this round uh, with you because you say, and I really like this, uh, the way you're putting it, there is a cost of inaction in this, um, meaning that there is an urgent, uh, an, an urgency to change the way uh, we we use, we design, I guess, also, and we use algorithm. Uh, why is that? So I think um, I, there is two reasons for that. One that um, I witness like every day at We Farm. So um, is that the, the more tools and technologies are developed to solve our Western centric, centric problems. So um, if you look at a loop, like creating a spam filter, typically, you'll have dozens of examples of spam filters designed in English, using tools and libraries that are designed to understand the English language. And actually, all of these technologies don't exist in languages that are less common. So you'll find them in like, Chinese and Russian, or, you know, French and Spanish, but you won't find them in Swahili, Luganda, or Renan Kore. And I think it's there is an urgency to make sure that we develop these technologies for everyone in the world and not just for essentially people in California who are at the forefront of what's happening. Um, and I think so in you know in, in WeFam we I say I don't think we are yet there where in terms of inclusive algorithms because a lot of our algorithms still perform better in English. So our spam filter is better in English than it is in other languages. But we actually spend a lot of resources trying to change that and spending time understanding these rare languages, what, what, what are called rare. Obviously, they're not rare at all where we operate, <laughs> but they're rare in the sense that they're not spoken by a lot of people in the world. Um, and so I think it's important that we start closing that gap um, as much as we can. And the other thing is, um, let's not forget that every crisis there is, every time there is like a new humanitarian crisis starting, there are really people who are paying the price for like not using the technologies if we are missing on opportunities. And it's important to remember that, yes, there are risks and we need to be careful and aware and make sure that we put the resources towards mitigating these risks. But also if technology gives us the opportunity to fast, like, to act faster, or to act better, then we really need to make sure that we get on board of that train and make sure that we use these opportunities. Thanks a lot. Um, since we do have, um, oh, we do have a question actually, but maybe Claire, do you want it to, do you want to tell us a bit more about the, the other examples that you shared or maybe just a, te a teaser? Yeah, so I, I, I just shared the uh, DataKind page where it, they showcase different projects that we've been working on. Um, I think maybe like 
really hot of the press, a pro project that hasn't happened yet, is um, a project I'm currently working on, which is um, using data to uh, help people. So I'm working with a charity that does debt counselling. And they have been in a situation in the past where their processes were so human intensive that it was just too many people knocking at their door and they had to like, turn people away because they couldn't help anymore. Um, so we're seeing whether we could use their data to help make decisions more accurately and faster um, so that they don't have to turn people away anymore. So that's like one example that I can't tell you the impact yet because the project hasn't happened, um, but hopefully we can help with that using machine learning so that instead of having to provide, you know, a hundred bit of information, someone can only provide like three. And if three is enough for them to make a decision, then they get fast forwarded towards their faster solution towards a debt free life. Um, and maybe a hundred bits of information is needed. But the question is, is it always needed for everyone? Um, and can technology help streamlining these processes? Um, so there is, I don't know, that's yeah, one teaser of another project that's happening. Um, but I think DataKind has a lot on their page of things that they've done in the past. Um, I wasn't involved in all of them, so I can't really go into too much detail, but you know, Perfect, homeless yeah. investigation um, are things that we have done a lot of work with. Great, thanks a lot for this. Um, and we have a question from Chloe. Um, Chloe is asking about beneficiaries' reactions to the use of algorithms. And her question is, um, his, her assumption is, can it lead to less interest in participating by feeling like you're responding to an AI? Um, I would instinctively uh, maybe take this to Liz, but anyone else who wants to take this, don't hesitate. Yeah, happy to answer. So, I mean, I think in general, you know, what, what you find in Lebanon is that often um, refugees who are receiving forms of assistance from, from NGOs, from the UN, um, feel a kind of obligation to, to take part in, you know, research, assessments, monitoring and evaluation, because um, I think there's an underlying feeling that uh, you know, it, it helps to ensure that they continue to receive assistance. There is a fear somewhere that if they don't um, take part, that they they won't be considered for assistance. They'll lose assess uh, assistance. And I think that's, you know, it's something that however many informed consent processes you do, however much you reassure people that that's not the case, I don't think that fear goes away for people. So I don't think that you find that people... Um, participate less in assessments or research activities um, because I think that there's that feeling for people um, but I think you know it is a really um, it's been an important focus for our working chameleon it's been about sort of capturing people's perceptions of the the algorithm and what they think it is and that's been really important so you know some people talk about it being fate god uh, a lottery a computer um and so there's you know it's about really understanding you know what is it that's sort of just dis discussed amongst communities amongst families because i think that's important for understanding how it's sort of received um and there's an enormous amount of data coming through the un cash call center as well so when we looked at the kind of uh, macro trends of that data, we found that there was uh, a million questions, a, a million calls took place uh, in, in a two year period that related to targeting and eligibility. So um, I think that also shows how that 70% of all the calls received by the call centre, what an important targeting, uh, what an important question, um, a concern, eligibility for caches in Lebanon. I think if I can Add on this, I think the, the question Chloe is asking is, is really important, not, not so much in terms of in like participating, because as you said, uh, Liz, in, in Lebanon, I think there is a real appetite to participate. Um, but just in terms of transparency, I think the users are a big part of, of developing technology. Um, and I guess now working in, in like more of a tech companies, like we, we interact with our users on a on a very regular basis. Uh, we invite them to like usability testing. We call them like every maybe every week we are in touch with our users directly. 
So I think it's really important to not lose track of this. And one example that I think we, we had that question at WeFarm, but it's probably less important than the example I'm going to share. Um, there was this mental health charity that had this chatbot um, to help uh, you know, direct people quicker to the right service. They had a chatbot where you could ask a question, but obviously they needed to pick up whenever someone was in a time of crisis, because if someone is having suicidal thoughts, like you can't let them interact with an AI or give them a phone number. Like you, you really need to respond to that quickly. But then there was this problem that people who spoke English as a second language or couldn't like type as well um, would be less likely to be picked up by this chatbot. And so I think that there is a real question of like, do you want to make your chatbot that good that it looks like a human? Or do you want to be clear to your users and say, you are now interacting with a chatbot. If you wish to speak to a human, click on this button. Or, or you know, that's one of the possibilities. But I think it's really important to have these questions and involve the users in how they feel about it, because it is sometimes life or death questions and we can't just leave it to chance. Um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. Um, just throwing the, the chat was interesting because one of our CDAC members, Translators Without Borders, TWB, they, they're putting a lot of effort into what they call hard to source languages, which is um, less common ones. Um, um, so in, in places like DRC, Nigeria and Bangladesh, and especially Rohingya, which bit the part I know best. And what they are working on is the fact that the interesting about algorithms, of course, is the fact that it also increases you know, the well-designed ones, is they work in these hard to source languages. And the idea being that people know they're interacting with a machine, but this machine actually speaks in a language they understand because 90% of the materials from the response regarding COVID-19 was in a language they do not naturally understand. It's not their first or second language. So it's a case of, it's a case of um, once people know, I mean, there's no hiding the fact that they are speaking to a machine. And it's still experimental and the places I've tested and there's still the results are coming in. But the question here is, of course, is once people know that is about that there is now information about COVID in these languages, which wouldn't be other, available widely otherwise. So because the preferred method is face-to-face is -face communication under COVID, of course, people couldn't move around at all, even the, the people who normally do this. So it was this or nothing. Um, so sometimes, so it is a case of, it is again, comes back to design. And of course they're putting a very lot of effort into human centric design on this, but it is a, it is a case of, um, does it put people off? Well, the alternative is, is nothing. And so, so that's what they're working on at the moment. And, and then you, and then it's, it's a case of, um, it's also the case of, um, in the other project I was talking on is the most ethical thing, but people didn't realize about that because the front end the interactions was always with people. So there's no putting off of the interactions of the interactive with an algorithm because it was the back end that was being driven by algorithmic processes. But they always ever the, the people, the, the people we, we were serving were always only ever interacting with people. All the data collectors were people. All the feedback they gave to the to gave back afterwards were to people and also changes of the services and the information about them, um, good or bad, through other media and through person were also for people. So, so the interesting thing is that the, the fact that the decisions about their lives are being made by an algorithmic system or a traditional humanitarian system going through lots of meetings didn't make any difference from their front end because or they're the people they dealt with exactly the same people. And I think that's the the um, that's that's something to to think about is that when we do this is is again who does it serve? I mean, it serves our, you know that kind of level of AI only serves our processes. <laughs> Because as far as people are concerned, if things aren't working, it's the person they're dealing with is still a person. Thank you. Thanks. That's yeah, that's a very good question. And it goes back to um, what what where is automation needed? Um, I think which is a quite a central question. Sophia, taking advantage of, of this uh, question on participation, uh, do is there is this anything is, is this something that you saw in one of your projects or? Yeah, uh, we have had projects that, again, as uh, was mentioned, they didn't have direct contact with uh, our um, um, person of concern. So 
we did have though some of the projects that were internally demanded. Uh, for example, we had a collaboration with human resources, and that's where beneficiaries were the users was the recruitment agents that we have uh, that work for the organization that need to quickly parse and like select the right people for the right position. So I think even there it was not uh, a direct line of communication with uh, with the people, but another person again would deal with the outcome, uh, evaluate the outcome, and then uh, contact contact the beneficiaries. So uh, directly contact not. And even when we were trying to do uh, in Somalia a project where we were predicting uh, movement again, then we relied on our team of information managers uh, that would always like um, take actions or anything but they never uh like the the refugees or the idps in the specific context they would never uh, get to see any of the outcomes of the modeling so i don't think we have concrete examples i don't think we have deployed systems that uh, have that direct interaction for our for example like uganda uh, also feedback uh, call uh, data centers Again, they interact with uh, humans and then the data is collected and processed, let's say, but uh, it never comes down to a direct communication. Thanks for this. And please don't hesitate if you if you have any other questions. Um, we still have a couple of minutes left uh, for the conversation, so don't hesitate to, to jump in. Um, any, maybe I'm going to, to, to ask the, the, the speakers if they do have um, other other reaction, anything else that come to their mind um, that would be useful for people listening to us to take into account uh, when either uh, deciding to use an algorithm, designing an algorithm, um, or designing an accountability and monitoring an accountability uh, uh, process uh, for an algorithm. And I see I see Fanman that you've unmuted. Yes, it was it was to do with the fact that the projects I've managed quite recently, they've always have a small percentage saying technical innovation. And one of the things I suggest would be algorithmic type processes. And I kind of think that the absolute worst time to ask somebody to come up with a new algorithmic process for humanitarian response is as you start on an emergency response. So this is, you know, it's like, so you, so in funding proposals, they say, here's a funding proposal, we're going to do all these things, we're going to, we're going to get all this feedback, we're going, to, we're going to distribute this much stuff, we're going to save this many people. And also at the same time, while I was doing all this and working 18 hour days, I'm going to oversee an invention of a new algorithm that can automate the thing. And without going, that, that will be ready probably a little bit after we finish the funding of the project, because and I think it's time we need to think about how we are developing these things and why we're doing it. Instead of saying innovation for a crisis, it should be think about innovations for preparation and then yeah, build the engines. Um, if we take example from the gaming world, a lot of interesting games are built on standard gaming engines, right? So I don't know enough of the technology that we can do, but it's the case of, and it can't be transported from place to place because almost everything we do is bespoke. The chatbot systems we're talking about now, that each one has to have a, almost a totally different system. But there are some fundamental core components which can be moved from parts to the other because each language has a total language is about metaphor. So every language is a different metaphorical system. So, but there are still standard things that can be moved from place to place. And it's like maybe the case of start thinking about, about um, not working on what can we do for this response or that development project, that, but start actually thinking about it funding in a slightly different way. And the other thing is, it's a case of considering who's it benefit, who's it automating. It's a case of, is it, you know, is it the auto fact that, you know, the people we're saving money for are the people from, um, you know, so who are here, so, so, so as in, will senior managers running the middle processes be prepared to fund these things if it's their own jobs that's going to be automated away because it's always talking about frontline stuff but also back-end stuff so that, those are two thoughts but my main thought is the fact that um developing these things takes time and they take um and they take resourcing and they take time to test properly and the worst place of all is to test them with people who are in need, who are vulnerable, and you're under stress. And project management is at its weakest because so many unexpected events are happening at the same time. So I think we need to fundamentally rethink um, from a human on the humanitarian level. Um, at which point did we start commissioning these things? 
I think there is, um, in terms of like tips of how to develop, I, I really agree with Fanman that um, you can't really expect a, a new fully fledged artificial orientation system to be built during a time of crisis. Um, I do think these these building blocks can be built um, and backported from from environment to environment, though. So I think there is something to be learned over time. Um, and I forgot what I was going to say about. Oh yeah, no. The other point that I wanted to make is if you're get starting to develop new data systems, new algorithms, um, I think do get involved in a lot of communities. So there are like. If you code in R, there is R user groups. If you code in Python, there is Python user groups. Um, there are loads of data science meetups and, and the community is actually really supportive. Um, the chances are someone has done something very similar to what you're trying to do in the past and you can learn from them. I think it's really important to do that. Um, and, and I think software engineering and, and data science is actually a really nice community of people ready to help each other, which is kind of strange, like not many other, I think, sectors do that. Um, so, so I think it's really important to be involved because these are also the people who can uh, wave a red flag if you're going down a dangerous route. Um, we do that a lot with Data Kind. We support charities on a kind of, every month we have this office hour where someone can come and say, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. What do you have, do you have any advice? And this is a, an important point at which we're, helping them think through all of these ethical questions as well. So I think do get involved in the community, do reach out to people who are trying to do the same and see what their experience was, because you might have a lot to learn from them. And I would also heartily encourage that you people, when they do this, I mean, it is a lovely community where people get involved, people like doing this, but also they tend to exist in almost every country on the planet these days. There's always somebody somewhere who does development and they already have a, a, a way and insight to the community. And it's really, really useful to... The, the, the thing about the entry level to a lot of technology at a starting level is not very high. So, there's, so it's actually quite easy to find people who are interested in every community. And you can start building from, you know, you're building from there. It's almost the same thing that we've said about almost everything with the community engagement in the humanitarian development world, but even more, even more so in this area sometimes, because the level entry is quite, quite low. So you, it is worth looking at local local talent and starting from there as well, and and in integrating and building platforms, building platforms that integrate people together. Interesting thoughts. So, yes. So giving the floor to Sophia and then going back okay. to Edith's question, just for you to know, Edith, that we haven't forgotten you. Sophia, please. Okay. Yes. So again, exactly as uh, the, the previous speakers mentioned. So. Academia, for example, has already a lot of advancements and they actually want um, the humanitarian actors to give them a little bit of guidance towards to where they, they should uh, uh, direct their research uh, mostly. So I think also collaborating with academia, but also maybe local academia is very, really interesting to engage with. They have done maybe a little bit more of, it, let's say, ethnographic uh, or logographic search, uh, research and that could fit into uh, the type of problem that you might be having. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah, nice, uh, nice to remember that lo yeah, locally you, you can also have uh, uh, such resources. Thank you for this. Um, just um, bouncing back actually on what Fanman uh, was saying uh, right before about testing the algorithm and because I, I see uh, Edith's question still hanging on there. Um, Liz, if you could maybe take this have there been iterations of the algorithm in Lebanon um I yeah that, so yeah. yes definitely so um you know there's been two main groups that have sort of supported the UN with the recalibration of the the targeting um model each year so the first group were from the American University of Beirut and then more recently, it's been Development Analytics, who is, uh, you know, a, a group that are based in the US. Um, I think it's been a good thing for for the the kind of the the, the learning element that Development Analytics has been um, involved in the last few years. Um, and there have been kind of iterations. So an example is that the number of variables that are included in the um, algorithm has reduced. 
um, in more recent years to kind of avoid um, multi-collinearity. Um, so, you know, I think an important um, element of this for, for actors like Chameleon and those of us who are outside of the UN is that we have these regular opportunities, um, particularly kind of when the, the new kind of recalibration process kickstarts every year to come together to ask questions, to ask kind of critical questions, uh, ask technical questions, um, bring in the learning. And so I think having Chameleon that kind of has that sort of role of documenting the learning over multiple years funded by the same donors as the UN is really important and we actually have one happening on Friday so we have a dedicated session on this this targeting approach where development analytics will be there and you know a broad range of stakeholders are invited so I think that kind of the the inclusivity and bringing in different actors especially considering that Lebanon is kind of working through the these coordinated um, processes and mechanisms is really important and I think it's going to be significant because we know that that's the direction that humanitarian cash is going globally as well um, you know with these kind of um, approaches uh, becoming more coordinated and kind of a growth in, in large-scale cash programs. Yeah it's definitely the, the way it's taking. Um, maybe one last question um, uh, uh, someone from the, the, the participants wondering if the panelists have any thoughts on algorithms operating on large data sets aiming to compare various responses or contexts uh, such as JIAF that I'm not familiar with, sorry about that. Um, anyone inspired by this? Uh, I think the World Food Programme with OCHA that they were, were responding to that, they were doing some kind of analysis and they were combining so the, the data sets from um, different actors um, on large data sets. I think they were trying to find maybe a little bit of correlations between like how they maybe they can describe the situation uh, and give a global reporting tool, if I'm not mistaken. But um, then on, like operating on large data sets again i think we're playing with the representation uh thing so like exactly you need to have a little bit of uh, um not guidelines but as a structure of how the data was collected all of the reporting how it was done uh what is it representing what is it not representing and like what are your gaps uh def operating on large data sets and they were doing al algorithms i if the anonymous can also respond to this but uh, I, I'm not sure if they were using any machine learning uh, algorithms to produce uh, outcome, just maybe a little bit of exploratory data analysis in that context. I'm not sure um, we're doing this, you're referring to the same thing, but so I'm working on, I'm, I'm part of a panel on doing something with various large organizations through. Um, the ICC, and, um, but that's not machine learning. We're just having difficulty just getting compatible data sets from different organizations. I mean, that is proving quite difficult just to start with. I don't think we've moved on to doing anything there yet on that. Though the plan is ultimately one day to do that. Yeah, exactly. Because also at UNHCR, there is an effort to do an interagency effort uh, for the whole Sahel region to do a little bit of predictive analytics in that area and even just collecting and like coming up with all of the data sets that might be have some of the indicators that predict movement is really difficult to even compose. And like, for example, collection is not even a point because it will require a different <laughs> project on itself to start collecting. Um, this. So yeah, I think I think this is also the point that stalls a lot of the projects, the, the gaps that we have in data or how we communicate with the other agencies. Thank you so much for taking the, the, the time to respond. I think we might be able to close here the conversation if that's all right, if there is no more question coming from the participants. Um, so before we close, um, allow me to thank all the, the speakers for this very uh, um, resourceful conversation. Um, I think if, if I want it, uh, this is not going to, I'm not pretending to be uh, exhaustive at all because you raised uh, so many different uh, uh, um, issues and principles that, is, that are worth taking uh, in, uh, keeping in mind. But um, uh, for me, 
just a couple things that I noted that I, I will be uh, uh, taking with me. Um, first of all, the, 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 the cost of inaction, the urgency to, to act uh, and to take these uh, considerations into account uh, because there are consequences. We've, we've talked about some of them. Um, and I think as um, uh, uh, less privileged uh, uh, people of the members of the, the society, we do have a sense of this when we uh, uh, targeted uh, through um, uh, some of the, the social media, some of the Facebook algorithm or, or so on, because it's not the only one, they're not the only one doing this. We do have a sense of, you know, the consequences on, on our lives. Um, uh, but when it when it gets to uh, uh, less uh, privileged, uh, marginalized and, 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 uh, and overlooked communities, um, as we said, uh, those are life-changing decisions that are being made based on automated uh, sets, sets of instructions. Um, so I just want us to, you know, I just wanted to point out the the the, the cost of inaction and the urgency to 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 take this into consideration. As Ben Parker was also mentioning it in the opening um, uh, panel. Um, maybe also um, uh, two things that I noted that I thought were was were very uh, uh, essential to this debate. Uh, the need to understand the why. Why do we want to automate uh, a process? Um, uh, where is automation needed? Is it if it's needed? Uh, and what's the added value? Uh, what will it will it cost also to do it uh, versus not doing it and using humans? Um, and also getting the design right from the beginning, uh, the, getting it inclusive as well. I really like the the. the the point about language, the fact that most of the technology that is being developed is using a, a one ling language or two languages. Um, and then the second and last thing that I also will remember is the need to have the right skill sets. And I, I know that this is something that always comes back in the GONG conversations, but I think it's always worth saying it um, uh, with the right uh, skill set and the right budgeting for it. Um, uh, because. You, you do need, we do need to have the right data people, senior people, we, who will have a precise idea of what will go wrong, what can go wrong with the algorithm before uh, jumping into it. Um, so many other points that were raised. Uh, thank you so much um, for uh, being with us. Uh, wonderful speakers. Thank you to the participants. And lastly, thank you for uh, G the GONG team. Thank you to Carto NG and at Stretch this year for allowing us to have this conversation. Maybe, maybe the beginning for a, a research paper, something uh, maybe more extensive about this, because I think there is a need uh, to share uh, learning. Um, so uh, let's the conversation continue and, uh, and uh, hoping to see you all very soon. Thank you very much. Thanks for organizing, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you. Thank you.